Dan. Oh, this is a special episode because mm-hmm. for once we're actually joined um, by a third person to talk about this uh, reading that I found especially challenging. So we figured we should bring on uh, an extra brain to try and get through this. Um, <laughs> Increase the variety of the podcast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and just hope that everything gets caught at some point by someone <laughs> that will eventually get there. So we're joined by Viv. Um, Viv, I don't know how to introduce you, I suppose one of the editors of the new journal, The Black Lamp, which people can go check out. Um, we'll put a link somewhere. Go check that out. It's a lot of really good stuff. Um, professional podcast guest is something that I thought of as well. Um, <laughs> but we're here with uh, Viv. Viv, how you doing? Hello, I'm good. Thank you. How are you? I'm doing fine. I'm getting on. Um, like I said, this reading that we went through for this week's episode, um, I'm feeling like maybe 80% on. 80% like feeling like I can maybe talk about this. I did struggle with it a little bit, but we'll get to what it is and all of that here in a bit. Um, Viv, for the people who don't know, I wanted to ask you before we got started. Um, this is an election year in the United States, uh, a particularly kind of insane one. And today I was kind of doing some thinking about like the difference between British politics and American politics as they like slowly kind of unravel and slowly get more and more insane. And I kind of came to the conclusion that British politics are very like, like the UK's politics are very uh, unhinged, I think is a good way to put it. Whereas American politics are just like rabid and psychotic, I think, and getting more and more psychotic by the moment. So you're, you're living in Arizona at the moment, famously, a bit of a red state, a bit conservative. I'm kind of keen to know what it's like as a quote unquote, kind of like outsider to America. What is it like at the moment, especially in the election year? How is everybody doing down there? Uh, well, firstly, it, I think in Britain, people don't like to talk about politics. It's like almost low brow to discuss politics. It's unsavory. Um, whereas here, everyone loves it. Like, it's it's always just below the surface and they're very keen to kind of like engage in some sort of some quite surface level conversation about politics in a way that's quite nice um i I think i had just moved here and we were in an uber and the driver's just making conversation asking what i do um, I'm 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 a postdoc in population genetics, and so as soon as he heard genetics, he wanted to start talking about um, obviously <laughs> sexual determinism, trans identity. Oh no! Um, and I was like, oh, and we're off. And it was like a, it was um, it, it it was like he was he was extremely friendly, and it it, it didn't seem like an aggressive conversation in any way. But just the way he was sort of so willing to lean into that, and then sort of um, seamlessly move that conversation into great replacement theory sort of stuff. And um, (laughs) obviously this is like extremely reactionary conversation. Um, But at the same time, it's very disconcerting how people are willing to have those conversations so openly here. Whereas in the UK, it still seems like um, even often with close friends who aren't particularly political, I find they don't want to get drawn onto any sort of conversation like that, just in case there's any point of conflict. In terms of the upcoming election, to be honest, I don't know if much seems to have changed since I, I've been here for like coming up to two years now. And I don't know whether it's just a case of because Arizona is generally a red state and it turned blue. And so it's just been like on a permanent state of um, like instability in a sense and so and again i don't know whether this is the case in the u.s in general whether people love talking about politics or it's just here um but yeah i i I guess you see the academic side of it where people really like talking about um you know you have disappointed liberals um and then being in arizona in general and you have many people who have um what i don't know i guess I could only describe as some sort of identity as a cowboy, like an this would be an actual <laughs> thing here. Um, and so like this sort of inherent conservatism. And so, yeah, it's really jarring, but it's like a fun anthropological experience. In a yeah, sense. I think that's kind of what I've found being in England is like, it's very interesting. I don't know, Dan, I don't know how you find this about British politics, but like, I'm very much of the mind that I don't think people should really talk about politics. Like, 
really at all just in like friendly conversation i'm a lot more comfortable if people just don't bring it up because i'll just wind up getting frustrated or i won't say anything and i'll just be like ah, grumble 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 but i don't know I, do, I i think british people yeah they don't talk about it as much it's not as in your face like they're not driving around with like pickup trucks with like the american flag like on the back like you know waving in the wind or whatever but maybe it's a bit more passive aggressive out here i don't know mm, oh, yeah definitely <laughs> And it comes up in veiled form, doesn't it? And then the, the people say something in reference to something else and they try and draw you in or see, sort of sound you out on your ideas. They don't just sort of like lay out point A to point Z that gets them from, I don't know, bug gates to great replacement or something. And, <laughs> yeah. and we don't like, um, you've got to engage in a bit of back and forth to get to that point perhaps. But it's yeah. there. I encounter it from time to time. You know? Yeah. What are you going to do? It's interesting. It's very interesting. I will. I yeah. I wonder how long people can like keep not talking about it if that is the case over here. I don't know. We'll mm -hmm. see. I mean, yeah, maybe maybe we should not. Um, I mean, maybe this isn't what. When you just said that, then I was interpreting as like what's being hidden is like um, sort of joke politics. You know, politics that like um, that we might want to laugh at, but I suppose there is a necessity to. Um, politicize things in a way that maybe we're not comfortable with i definitely like struggle to like okay somebody's raised a political point how am i going to intervene in a way which is like productive to uh furthering a conversation with them that's not agreeing <laughs> with them but also not like um tell them to read some piece of Marx or something or just trying to, <laughs> trying to explain i don't know exchange value like versus whatever it's like it's like debate though isn't it it's more, there's, there's almost there's a lot of people there's just no point having any sort of debate with absolutely but it's the same with <laughs> conversation in general like yeah. if someone wants to have a political conversation with you which has no stakes and you fundamentally just disagree with each other kind of what's the point mm -hmm. yeah or i've absolutely can, can, found that you can recognize the low stakes and then just like jump in i'm a communist <laughs> let's go from there you know like, <laughs> yeah, which, exactly. might, which might be one i might try employing a bit more often <laughs> just like, Shock so, people are so unlikely to encounter somebody with my politics in everyday life it's like they might be more curious than they are anything else i don't know <laughs> yeah. yeah i'm willing to be a curiosity and an oddity i think i can bear that sort of like position socially you know just, yeah and you know, i do think that weird, if you're if you're just like honest about it up front, which I've literally have like never been once in my life about my actual politics, I feel like that's probably better than just like beating around the bush and being like, what about if things were like a bit more rational and planned and oh yeah, exchange value, use value. I don't know. And, but it's exactly what you're saying. Babe. I'm not entirely certain that there is like much of a point in a lot of this stuff in engaging with just like everyday people it's kind of like lazy as that sounds like unless someone's being like actively like discriminatory or hateful it's just like they're just trying to get a rise out of you and if you engage with them it's not really going to change much it's the thanksgiving dinner dilemma it's like what are you going to do like call out your uncle for being a prick like i don't know just eat the turkey you know what i'm saying <laughs> um all right. Well, we've solved uh, the political discourse on both sides of the <laughs> pond. Um, it's going to be a perfectly fine, normal year. I think yeah, year, you know? God. I know. I'm, I'm like moving back probably around August, September, and it's just like, ah, the most normal time I could have possibly decided to move back. <laughs> um, all right. Let's, uh, let's get into it. We So for this episode, uh, Dan and I have been saying New Year, New Us. We've been trying to read some things that are a bit more challenging. So we read um, Christopher Codwell's, uh, what is it? It's just The Crisis in Physics, I think is just what it's called. Um, kind of like an unfinished piece by a um, English philosopher who died really young because he went over to go join the International Brigades during the Spanish Civil War. And I think, as far as I can tell, it kind of died immediately, but was like a really... Um, really bright mind, really, really smart guy, pretty prolific, I say, even though this is unfinished. And um, this is basically him wading into the philosophy of science, um, debates that a kind of like 28 year old guy who with no university education, like scientific debates kind of has no, you would think had no real place engaging in, but he engages in them in a really spectacular way. This is a really phenomenal piece. Um, but like I was saying, I think I, I kind of struggled with this a little bit just to kind of understand what it was that he was saying. And I think it wasn't until like my second 
go through of like going through everything that I underlined and was like, is this important? Is this not important? That I was kind of able to understand at least a little bit of what he was saying. So he definitely touches base with a lot of quite difficult things, right? Like one minute he's talking about science and quantum mechanics and the 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 to, to his day newfound um, contradiction between the sort of macro and the um, quantum realms in physics, and then the next minute he's talking about sort of the history of development of European philosophy, and the next minute he's talking about sort of like. Um, uh, political economy and sort of Marxist political economy and then sort of weaving this web of tying all of those together. So I definitely agree. Sometimes it's quite difficult to keep track of, but also it's quite thrilling to see that effort laid out. Um, one of the things I enjoyed most about it was just like the, the variety um, of the things he speaks about and sort of the weaving of that narrative between. Um, yeah, so I guess that's my initial thoughts on it. Mm. I think just to touch on that, like the thing that's so impressive about this is exactly what you're saying, Dan. It's like one of the things that's so impressive about Marx is that when you read his work, he was very clearly of this era where like scientists weren't as specialized. And so if you wanted to kind of engage in scientific thought, scientific study, obviously this was beginning to change. But like even if you were a philosopher, you kind of made this attempt to understand as much as you possibly could about your society. And, you know, this is kind of like why in capital, like Marx spends time not just talking about political economy, but like soil ecology and chemistry and all of these things, right? It's like, it shows kind of a real appreciation for kind of like the totality of human knowledge and a real desire to understand as much as possible. And you definitely see that in the, in the Codwell here. And it was, yeah, it's like, it's so impressive that a guy this young with like, who's by all accounts, just a complete autodidact was able to engage in these debates. There's also like a level of admirable confidence where you can just sort of <laughs> go straight in and critique Eddington, critique Einstein. And um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> that takes like um, a real, I guess, confidence in your, not, not just your own knowledge, but also your own sort of philosophy and Again, as you mentioned, like it, uh, philosophy is like this totalizing thing where there's a consistency um, in its application. So it's not a case of um, you're constantly finding points which contradict your own philosophy and therefore that, you know, drags in its own self doubt and you kind of try to find a back door out of it, which Marxists do all the time. There's just this ability to take these same sort of ideas about how. Um, bourgeois societies and decay and the reason for that decay sort of being rooted in this um this uh cleavage between the subject and the object and like in a lot of his other work he applies that to literature um and here he largely applies it to um the cleavage between philosophy and science and yeah i don't know it's very impressive yeah yeah well, absolutely i always have a difficulty when an argument is so cleanly sort of totalizing almost I'm, i was a bit like is this um, I, I mean, like, enjoyable as it is for me to read and to, to experience somebody um, taking a Marxist critique of capitalism and the sort of like um, ideology of that mode of production, the sort of and and rooting that ideology in the um, the nature of the production that's done under that system and the sort of class dynamics of that. Um, sometimes I encounter arguments like this and they just feel too clean and too. Um, I don't know, maybe that's my personal uh, hurdle I, to get over, I guess. <laughs> no, I do agree with you. Like the, the neatly mapping, um, like social relations, uh, sort, of, sort of periods in physics on social relations. And <laughs> I think that is, that does feel like an overreach at times, like, like as an analog, fine. But to say this is exactly why um, physics was, like undergoing a revolutionary crisis at this moment because that's the same as an economic crisis. I don't know. It feels like mm -hmm. tenuous. And mm -hmm. I mean, he's like at the very end, what he shoehorns in is basically, and communism is inevitable. <laughs> <laughs> and um, this is what it's all leading to this crisis. And you're like, ah, here we go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, that's one of the things like it, it's, it's really of its time. This partly because of, um, the material that it's speaking of is very specific and new to when he's writing, but also um, it's full of that, like 
uh, the really heartwarming optimism that you get of writing from the beginning of the 20th century it's just like the inevitability of uh communism we're in the final crisis and it's not like it's not like it's very like um i read it as like very pu- like maybe purely marxist in a sense that like his his in- intent is to fu- develop almost like a philosophical argument for uh, the vital role that's to be played by the proletariat based on their place in production. They're able to like um, sort of like liberate our sort of like um, or free us from uh, bourgeois modes of thinking. Um, but it is, it is like, it, it, I mean, the, the, that he gets to that point of like promising communism as being the ultimate outcome of this contradiction Um feels like it's building through the text because it does feel like it's like rooted in this optimistic age of sort of high point of communism, I guess. Yeah. I think if I have any, like my main issue with it is that optimism about this, about the working class itself. And it feels like a type of like fetishization that like there, there are like two things that really turn me off of a lot of Marxist writings. And one of them is like, I don't know. One of them is like whenever anybody starts talking about like the immortal science, the immortal science of Marxism, the immortal science of Marxism, Leninism or Maoism or whatever. I just kind of am just like, okay, whatever. And then there's also like this kind of vein in a lot of Marxist writings that maybe we see here a little bit, which is like the working class is almost this like supernatural thing with this kind of like to- totalizing understanding of the world. And it's only through like our understanding that we'll be able to get to the future of communism. I I don't know. That feels like, as, as both of you are saying, like it feels optimistic to the point of kind of silly. Um, and I think that maybe it's actually a question of like, the class in itself and the class for itself. Maybe we can kind of get onto this conversation like a little bit later. Um, I think maybe we should probably start by just explaining what it is that he's referring to when he says the crisis in physics <laughs> before we start going off and just like going nuts a bit. Um, who who feels the most confident here in, ex- in giving a general outline of uh, the history of physics as it relates to this text and what this crisis is? I can give it a go if neither of you want to, but it wouldn't be that good. <laughs> Well, maybe we can we can approach it t- together. I guess I could start. Um, uh, obviously, he's writing this at the beginning of the twentieth century, um, post. Um, when is it? Nineteen twenty? Did you say? Jack? I think the thirties. Yeah. I think okay. I could be wrong. Let me so, look like, it up. Well, post um, uh, Einstein's um, writings on uh, general relativity and. Um, um, and getting into the point where there is this new emerging field of um, quantum mechanics, qu- sort of investigations by physicists into the nature of the quantum world, um, and things that they're discovering through um, sort of like confidently verifi- verifiable experimental research is sort of demonstrating that the quantum world doesn't seem to follow the same rules that apply to sort of like the macro world of physics. And it's a real challenge to um, Einstein and Newton that have come before them who had this very p- sort of particular, um, uh, almost sort of mechanistic worldview that was reliant on certain um, understandings of cause and effect and what it is possible to measure and things that can be measured confidently. And um, this sort of new breed of physicist is looking at the quantum world and discovering that the closer that you observe certain qualities of a particle, other qualities become le- more difficult to measure. So you sort of can't, the closer you measure the behavior of something, the, its position becomes more difficult to tell. Is that the best way of putting it, you think? Yeah, and I think that like even in some cases when you observe these subatomic or atomic particles, um, in some cases they just change their behavior immediately because there seems to have been like a record of them made at some point somewhere. And it seems like the observer is actually influencing the outcome of these particles in a way that doesn't kind of jive with macro scale physics that was seemingly solved by Einstein, right? With like the theory of relativity and stuff. Um, And obviously goes against like Newtonian physics, which is just kind of like thing runs into other thing. Uh, That thing moves gravity. That's God who can explain it. Right. And it's interesting, like, like the reason that he's writing this and well, maybe we should just say, first of all, that like the reason that we're reading this is because 
that question, even almost 100 years later, is still pertinent and is still an unanswered question. How can you marry these two seemingly unmarriable branches of physics, which is microscale quantum physics and uh, macroscale, like, you know, physics along the lines of like things that operate as Einstein said that they would in, in general relativity, right? Um, and the reason that he's bringing this up is because he's saying that this is just a different form of the same crisis that we see in all forms of culture. Uh, it's an economic crisis. It's basically like this, all superstructural elements of society he's saying are being shaken by the economic crisis that he was living through. Um, and we can get on to maybe talking about kind of why that is still pertinent now, because like, obviously we're in very different times and there've been a number of crises and recoveries and crises and recoveries. But, um, yeah, just to say that that basic question still holds, um, physicists still aren't able to kind of understand how these two things can be true at the same time. And there are a number of circumstances where they have to be true and physicists just kind of go, I don't know, still can't answer it. Yeah. I think I'd add that, um, Kelpel talks about how the Newtonian universe is very much like atavistic particles that are like absolute in terms of how they they behave. Um, and Einstein comes along and shows that no, behave, this, behave, this behavior is all relative. But Kelpel um, does talk about how this didn't sit well with Einstein because he's still seeking like an absolutist. Uh, uh, framework to understand the world um, and that's directly linked to um, bourgeois thought like this idea that things are relative doesn't sit well because you <clears throat> bourgeois thought has um, developed this idea of you have this clean idea of the object um, isolated from the subject and therefore you, if you can isolate the object you can study it in isolation obviously if the world acts relatively then that's not actually possible and uh, and I guess this is the starting point of his critique that leads to um, like an advocacy for dialectical materialism. Yeah, well, well, yeah. one of the most interesting things about this was to see Einstein put alongside Newton as being um, defenders of a, a bourgeois or otherwise um, sort of old, obsolete way of thinking. Because um, obviously often he's... he's He's considered to be like, and in, is in a lot of ways like a um, sort of like a it's a somewhat revolutionary moment in the development of physics. Um, obviously, as you're saying, Jack, what Coleswell's doing is saying that like he's identifying this as a symptom of another problem, um, a more sort of like a problem that's being brought about by the sort of revolutionary age that is being lived through by, by these people. Um, there was a degree to which I wasn't really sure what connection he was drawing um, between like, is it that we're, we're these new generation of physicists are, are developing these ideas because they're living in a revolutionary age and almost like we're now discovering these things because of the age that's being lived through that by the people who's doing it. I think that's probably wrong. And it's more that just that, um, it's called this. Do these discoveries are causing such disquiet or discord in society because it runs parallel to um, other sort of uh, contradictions in social relations coming to a head? I guess. Yeah, I feel like it's the latter. I yeah. feel like it's him just saying this is the first time in a very long time that, or maybe it's just the first time that physicists are being forced to philosophize. They're being confronted with these questions of like whoa, wait a minute. Actually, we can't just be entirely positivistic or deterministic about these things because we're being forced into these situations with quantum mechanics where particles are popping in and out of existence. They're in the same place at two times. Like They're being forced into a position where they need to have a philosophy to guide their science. And bourgeois society has kind of cleaved these two things apart, the kind of like subjective philosophy and the practice, right? And he, I think he's basically just saying that that philosophizing has been completely unsuccessful. And because we're still, you know, this might sound wooey or whatever, but because we're still trapped in this like age of bourgeois philosophy, bourgeois philosophers are being forced or bourgeois scientists are being forced to philosophize in a way that they never have been. And they're just kind of floundering. They're kind of coming up with all of these weird mystical 
uh, you know, approaches to quantum mechanics. And we see this today, like put on any like science channel, every man's explanation of like quantum mechanics or whatever. And so much of it is just like, and this stuff's unknowable, you know, who knows, man. And it's just like, it is, how is that different from Newton being like gravity? That's just God. Right. Um, I, I just like, he phrases it quite nicely in terms of, uh, like, contrasting like reform to revolution almost uh, in terms of these revolutionary crises in science so it's almost like a um, almost a Kuhnian view where like a revolutionary crisis occurs when contradictions discovered in practice cannot be overcome like with a rearrangement of content so like a like like a ref like reform um within the categories of the dominant ideology kind of what jack was saying um so what what ultimately is necessitated is you've reached a point where only revolution will suffice. Uh, what's he call it? Um, so this explosion, this sort of revolutionary explosion, is dependent on a certain ripeness in the categories. So you have to hit like this point of um, like linear development hits like a road, but almost like um, punctuated equilibria in a sense. Like you can only get so far before. Um, you just hit this 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 block where pra practice can no longer be reconciled with the current ideology. And he does even say that um, a lot of what Einstein is doing is actually reworking um, difficulties that other people were aware of. Like he does quite a good job, which I won't run through because I don't really understand it. But he does quite a good job of laying out the steps that are taken by physics um, between Newton and Einstein, and how there were degrees to which some of these the knowledge of how um, the, or sort of a developing understanding of the nature of the relativistic uh, nature of the universe was sort of becoming known. Obviously what he says that Einstein does is kind of like um, make that relativism, not a problem, but like a fundamental feature of the universe itself kind of thing and works that into the the worldview. But it's just, as you were saying before, it's like, he's actually re, uh, rearranging ideas that are already there and sort of trying to salvage the situation more than he is um, following through with that revolutionary potential, I guess. So am I reading this correctly to say that this this kind of like stalled paradigm shift has been bought about mainly by quant the discoveries of quantum mechanics? Because it seems like it seems like general relativity was a complete paradigm shift for our understanding of physics. I mean, obviously, if you go back and like, you know, read about Einstein's times, like people were pretty reticent to believe in this theory until he was able to like prove it with it was either like the orbit of Mercury or something like that and like force people to be like, no, this is actually the way things work, at least on a macro scale. But it seems like it was relatively simple for bourgeois society to accept general relativity, whereas with quantum mechanics, because there are these kind of like philosophical questions it seems like they are almost unan. Codwell seems to be saying that they're unanswerable in bourgeois society. Does that make sense? I, I mean, like, I think Codwell at a certain point basically says that general relativity was kind of accepted because it doesn't really go up against um, like determinism or mechanism to a certain extent. Is that correct? I think. That, I mean, in a certain sense, it it, it does raise contradictions that in some that are kind of you can't really reconcile them in terms of like a relative universe as opposed to an absolute one um as something as we discussed like einstein himself kind of was against like but it, the idea that you should have a, a an absolutist universe in itself is like a metaphysical assumption which cabal kind of points out i think you just get to the point of um the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, and then there's no, there's no, you can't really sweep that under the rug. But I, I wouldn't say that you could really reconcile relativity either in, in that sense within the same like absolutist Newtonian framework. But I, I, again, I guess these things don't really like just like neatly map on in that you have your one crisis and then it's just a like a, an instant reaction to it. Even, I mean, even with uh, quantum physics, whilst this crisis is occurring, uh, in what, how is that actually manifested in terms of like, like physics carries on operating under the same principles? It's it's a Marxist here identifying 
a revolutionary crisis that's occurring. Yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, that's, that's kind of the main question I think about this, that this piece brought up for me is it's like, to what extent is this crisis actually kind of like affecting the domain of science and how science is actually practiced? Um, and to what extent is it more of like a metaphysical crisis? Because I don't know, Dan, you and I were kind of talking about this a bit before. Is it basically saying that certain quantum discoveries just can't be made under capitalism? Is that because that seems like that would be like a very uh, bold statement to be made? Or is it just saying that like our theoretical understanding of these things will never be complete until we accept the immortal truth of dialectical materialism? <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, I don't think I don't think a development in our consciousness has the capacity to change the nature of the universe. I guess, and Unless he's very, does. he's very, you know, he's very, um, in all of his criticisms of the nature of um, bourgeois physics and the way it relates to bourgeois philosophy, or the where there is a lack of relation, but the the cause of that lack of relation is the nature of um, ideology under the modes of production. He's very keen to say that these rules still apply, you know, there is still truth in the mechanistic universe that's being laid out by um, these physicists. And he has no intention of like, somehow calling that into question, I suppose that would be like, that would be very, because he's a materialist, like, it's not these are still materially true observations to the capacity that we're able to our science allows us to make the observations of the universe, I guess. I don't think that I answers your question. But but this does point to, like, I guess one of the more interesting parts of this text, looking at it from our vantage point so much later in terms of science and bourgeois thought has managed to, like, absorb a lot of this stuff. If you think about systems theory, if you think about cybernetics, it's not a case of, like, the idea of a relative universe. The idea of a probabilistic universe is is now... Um, considered like problematic in the same way. Um, and in that sense, I guess you could argue Caldwell, I mean, well, he was certainly wrong about how this was all leading to communism, but um, I, I think where it does butt heads with um, bourgeois thought is science is a profit driven endeavor under capitalism and the very idea of like a relational complex universe means developing complex models which account for these multiple processes occurring and doing that takes a lot of time takes a lot of patience and when you look at like science in terms of like an economic industry it is all about obviously churning out papers and it's highly competitive blah 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 and so I think that's kind of where you see these contradictions rearing their heads today. But I, I do think in some ways, um, philosophically at least, um, much of this has been absorbed, even though there is, like, in practice, that's not always the case. I guess there's just the general assumption that these two things will at some point be reconciled. And we now build a model of physics that includes both of them and holds them separate, but anticipates the point when some grand unifying theory will bring them together and there are people working on that and proposing those kind of things. Um, and I suppose it, it helps that like no discovery is going to stop the sun going around the earth or like discoveries of, um, I guess now discoveries in quantum mechanics are now allowing for the development of quantum computing and that kind of thing. So like in terms of what you were saying about science being a profit driven endeavor, like research is now leading to points where these are becoming, um, uh, maybe commercially viable applications for these discoveries kind of thing. But yeah, it's not, um, yeah, it's not preventing people from going to work and continuing to reproduce capitalism or anything like that, I guess. Yeah. And I, I guess it is just the general kind of idea that capitalism has obviously has become a fetter on the entire productive apparatus and, you know, science isn't science broadly speaking, isn't like um, free of that. I was kind of hoping he would talk a little bit more in here about specialization <clears throat> he kind of he doesn't talk about it a whole lot, but his his point is basically just to say that increasing specialization has led to a point where like this totalizing worldview can't really be had. And on one hand, I, th I think that that's like a really really interesting point because obviously it would seem like it would be better for everybody trying to kind of like understand the natural world or whatever if 
the people researching these things could have a general understanding of philosophy or a general understanding of physics, blah, 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 blah. But on the other hand, it's like, to what extent is that really possible to like get to that point under communism? I mean, unless we kind of set our sights differently to what it is that we'd actually want to accomplish, like, I don't know, call me crazy, but I'm not sure even under communism that we'd get to be able to like study a black hole up close. You know what I mean? Like, it seems like there are certain things that just won't happen, but like, I suppose this just brings up a bigger question of, you know, how much specialization is good, how much specialization is bad. Um, Obviously, capitalism has gotten to a point where like, I mean, Viv, you could probably speak to this a bit more about how science is actually like done or whatever, but I've heard certain people talk about how science is becoming much more proletarianized because of this kind of specialization. And, you know, if you're a specialist in one thing, you hyper-focus on that at the expense of everything else. I don't know if that really like affects certain fields as much as I'm kind of like making it out to be, because it does seem like, you know, if you want to work at like the Hadron Collider or whatever, you probably do need to specialize in a very specific thing to be able to make any of that stuff work, right? Um, but yeah, I don't know. And you're in like in your experience, has that actually like does it affect the study of science? I think it does. Um, I think there's an inevitable need for specialization in terms of like specialist skill and knowledge, but then it's then it raises the question of if that's it becomes an end in itself to like understand this small branch of something rather than um, what it's kind of overarching effect is on the wider system. It's like uh, it's, it's, it's focusing solely on a subsystem without concern for um, the subsystems it's linked to the wider system itself and what its effects are. And so I mean, unless there's dialogue between these different research programs, you end up just moving further and further apart. And Cavill talks about this in terms of like how compartmentalization helps to avoid addressing these contradictions. And really, a lot of science where it gets interesting is on these edge cases where you're kind of shifting into these like between different fields or different realms of expertise. Um, and it, but again, I don't want to keep beating on the whole profit motive drum but the whole notion of being like uh, like being incentivized to just churn out as many papers as possible means like the idea of interesting disciplinary interdisciplinary but also like exploratory research with no like guaranteed outcome coming out of it isn't going to be something you can necessarily embark on particularly like as an early career researcher when you need to you know like you're basically your your job status is unstable until you either decide to drop out because there's no jobs or you get lucky enough to get tenure and then you can do what you want. Um, I, I, I think the entire like academic industry to some extent is kind of geared this way. Like the, the position of postdoc was never a thing. You'd do your PhD and then you'd become te- you're tenured. That's that was there was no middle step and you introduced this middle step of like basically cheap labor. And then cheap labor needs to keep producing papers. And so you focus on these like, but you also need to stand out as like a unique individual because it's like an individualized profession. And therefore you specialize and you specialize and you specialize and you're basically atomizing yourself from like your field, never mind how your wider field interacts with other fields. And so you just have like a huge amount of scientific literature being produced with much less in terms of like, stitching this together as like a wider story and then that kind of raises the question of what are we actually doing this for in terms of are we actually trying to understand our world or are we just doing this because it's a job and we need to make money and realistically it is the latter right now yeah well maybe maybe then it's just that specialization versus like no specialization under communism is like I'm just thinking about this now. Maybe that is just the wrong way of thinking about it. Maybe it is a bit more of a question of cooperation. I mean, it would sound insane, right, for like somebody working at like the Hadron Colliders or something like that to have like a a couple philosophers on on hand, right? But like maybe I don't know. Like maybe under communism, it would make sense to have people who are like of different disciplines working with each other, and maybe the kind of question of 
uh, should everybody be a specialist or should everybody have this totalizing dialectical understanding of the world is the wrong way of thinking about it insofar as like, you know, communism is still going to have specialists. You know what I mean? Like, there's no reason not to, especially if we like take human freedom seriously. Like you wouldn't want to do something where it's like, you know, you're specializing in something. You're a nerd off to the gulags. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, it brings up quite an um, important part of this text where Caldwell talks about the what identifies as being like the fundamental contradiction in cap- capitalism being the distinction, as, as I remember, between um capitalism developing this very complex division of labor which is very productive and then still laboring or still still being fettered by this um by a by social relations that are um, based around private ownership of the means of production and sort of the, all the, the sort of profit seeking motive and the class division that stems from that um so yeah i guess i wonder I guess under communism, you'd still have that division of labor, but I guess we, you'd have to, maybe me now has to just hypothetically trust in some other type of socialist, communist, um, social relations being one which allow for greater communication or collaboration or just general social knowledge of at least what's happening in the world, if not direct collaboration and communi- like intervention in one another's work, but like a some general social knowledge that would that doesn't exist now because we're cut off from one another in our productive work because of the market and um, competitive market relations, I guess. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. And like you see that with like scientists always complain about how public knowledge of science is poor, but there's a reason for that. The public doesn't have access to scientific papers for a start. Um, that like the whole publishing industry is obviously well known as a scam because you pay to publish and then you pay have to pay to access that material even though taxation is what funds academia in the first place and so i think if we're thinking about what scientific research would be structured like under communism i think there would certainly be like a, a greater like collective understanding and means to actually acquire understanding of like scientific research and to be able to critique it. Um, and like once, once you kind of veer down that road, you kind of realize that a lot of it is just um, like a skill set. Like, I, I don't think when I tell people I'm in population genetics, they're obviously like, Oh, that's sounds clever. But the reason is because it's niche more than anything. It's like having a certain set of skills in terms of coding and having a certain set of like knowledge in terms of like population genetic theory. But these aren't things that anyone else wouldn't be able to acquire. It's just a question of it's, it's such a niche thing under capitalism and it's not accessible to everyone. And we have such little time to actually study these things if we wanted to. And I think it's just that like, like actual, like democratizing of knowledge. And then suddenly like the idea of specialization, whilst you, as you say, you'd need people who are able to run things like the LHC, you'd also be able to have a lot more lay people able to critique their work without someone just being like, how can you critique me? I'm, such and such and you're just a lay person that is such a cool idea just like the average schmuck at like the grocery store being like well the reason they're not getting any good results from the lhc is because of this Those i'm fools. gonna write a letter to the large Hadron collider <laughs> let them know what i think i mean Angry i guess that, galore. that is what it is right it's it's about it's i mean to a certain extent this is kind of what communism is right is it's about creating the circumstances for the general flourishing of the general intellect, right? For all of this inherited wisdom, all of these inherited discoveries to make their way into people's hands so that we can do what we want with them, right? And to make informed decisions about everything. It's a really beautiful idea, honestly. Um, And I think I've only really just kind of come to that conclusion just from talking about it now, that that's kind of what it is that he's actually aiming at, if it is. I don't know. Um... Do we want to talk a little bit about kind of his idea of the machine? Because this will kind of get us into a discussion of like nature and the subject object stuff. This was kind of one of the things that really tripped me up in the readings or in this reading. He's making this point that bourgeois mechanism and bourgeois like 
to a certain extent, even philosophy of science kind of is reflected in the way that the bourgeoisie sees capitalism or sees itself in capitalism, not as capitalism actually is, which I think is, first of all, a really profound point. I mean, I think Marx makes this point as well, but he's making the point that the bourgeoisie sees nature as a machine, right? And because of the relationship that the bourgeoisie has to the machine or whatever, they see themselves as, he, what does he say? He says something that they're conscious of their own ownership, but not as of their status as an owner, right? So it's how they see themselves in capitalism. They see themselves as kind of, you know, taking this risk on investment and being the kind of wealth producers of society, whereas that's clearly not how things actually work. And this is kind of where he gets into one of the things that I was a little bit unsure about where he talks about because of the proletariat's relationship to the machine and to nature in the sphere of production, they don't have this idea of society as very mechanistic and as uh, a one-way relationship, right? Where the bourgeoisie sees it just acts on nature and that's it. Whereas the working class sees that the working class acts on nature, but then nature also acts back on the working class. And so he says that there's this inherently dialectical um aspect of the working class, which I feel like, again, I mentioned this at the beginning, I feel like that's a latent, like that's a potential capability of the working class, not necessarily an actual one. I think that's kind of one of the main criticisms I would have. I don't think that like, maybe it isn't necessarily until it, the working class becomes a class for itself, that this distinction will be realized. Because I think that he's kind of, I think he's kind of falling victim to commodity fetishism here. He's kind of saying that like, the working class doesn't fall victim to commodity fetishism, which is like obviously not true. Like we all consume nothing but commodities. That's just the way everything works. So I don't necessarily know if that's true. Maybe I'm misreading it, but. I, I Maybe this is, I think probably how you'd interpret that. Cause I thought this was like one of my most important takeaways about like from this whole thing, because it's not so much to, falling into commodity fetishism it's the fact that the working class has the potential to um escape um like so uh, uh, john holloway um a marxist he talks about this distinction between fetishism and fetishization the idea of fetishism commodity fetishism as we know but it is like static it's, it's a thing that's happened and one of the things that Marxists have struggled with um, basically since 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 Marxism became a thing is how do we get outside of this? How do we explain why we communists, we Marxist revolutionaries have managed to get outside of it, but the working class can't? And he makes the distinction between that and the idea of fetishization, which is fetishism as an ongoing process that reproduces itself. And therefore, because it's an ongoing process, it is something that you are capable of getting outside. And I think this kind of subtle distinction is what Caldwell is getting at. Um, it's not that the working class is inherently revolutionary in that sense it's inherently capable of being revolutionary it's inherently capable of, of getting outside of this process of fetishization and understanding um like going beyond this subject object divide and i think th that understanding is why for me Cabell gets like has such a more sophisticated conception of science but also of um like marxism in general as opposed to people like lukash who couldn't get outside of it and had to invoke the party people like althusser who had to invoke the intellectual and i think this is like and the sort of um dialectical materialism that i could actually like get behind because it doesn't involve well we we've somehow found the answer and we're gonna have to take it to the rubes who can't possibly understand it by themselves. I think maybe I'm inclined to think about it the other way where it's like, it's not that the proletariat are like have a new unique vision, but kind of what he's focusing on more is the, the degree to which the bourgeoisie is blinded by its sort of necessary fixation on objects and why it's so, um, keen on this distinction between subject and object and maintaining it is because, to bring about capitalist social relations, it's created circumstances whereby the entire world is viewed in terms of objects and what you own, even 
even capitalism's relationship to how or maybe like a Marxist description of how the working class functions as a capitalism is just as bearers of a commodity labor value and nothing else kind of thing. Capitalism is set up around um, ownership of things and the capitalists are particularly fixated on that because um, what they're engaged in is this um, a relation to the productive process whereby so much of it is mystified to them. They're like, um, they... I mean, we've we've covered this on previous episodes of the podcast where we've sort of tried to talk about Marxist economics a bit, but like um, they invest in production, not necessarily knowing that the things that they produce, what what return they're going to get on those things. And uh, some of the most enjoyable language in this for me is the way Cold was talking about um, the bourgeoisie's relationship to the market and how um, it sees human desire kind of like transposed into this really mystical thing that it doesn't seem to understand um and generates all these kind of like laws tries to understand it in terms of mechanistic relationships and that you get the development of bourgeois economics as this effort to explain what's happening um and one of the things that he's talking about is this process of the transition from the early stage of capitalism where um bourgeois economics and um, in some respects, also the philosophy that's coming about at that time, and then also obviously the physics that's coming out about at that time, sort of bears this optimistic understanding of a mechanistic relationship and sees the world in this way. And what he seems to be saying is, as there as the sort of wheels come off this understanding of um, capitalism, and as the, capitalism's crisis tendencies um, become apparent, um, you get this sort of lack of confidence or this degradation in the bourgeoisie's understanding of the world and that sort of has a knock-on effect on all of these other aspects of bourgeois ideology um yeah those um that section on the stages of like the development of bourgeois class consciousness is like that that's that's really great like that as you mentioned that first stage of like um like bold like exploratory phase where like mechanism dominates and then like as you get out of that phase and you get into this more conservative, introverted phase, um, and it's reflected in like this turn to idealism and the philosophy of like Berkeley, Hume, uh, Kant, and Hegel, and then he shifts. To, then he talks about how positivism becomes like a dominant philosophy because the bourgeoisie shift from this revolutionary force to this completely conservative, conservative force, um, and like that's marked by this prevalence of positivism like both subject and object have now been sacrificed to this world of like mathematical rigor um which is completely detached from experience and um yeah and then he spends some time focusing on this like detachment from experience now physics is completely um like in its current state it cannot be reconciled with everyday experience it was funny to revisit that because like i did undergraduate philosophy and sort of like grappling with those ideas of like um the distinction between sort of sens- human sensuous experience as being is this something that happens in the brain as a sort of response to stimulus from the world and um are we experiencing the world in a way which is sort of like irreconcilably different and unknowable to the way that it actually is um it was quite nice to have him sort of just push back against that as being sort of just like um almost sort of bourgeois nonsense that needs to be overcome if we're to actually like i don't know like develop toward a, a collective experience that would make possible a, like a more collective social mode of production as well if only you had read this in your undergrad dan you could have been well, the I annoying kid have... in class like, <laughs> I, w- I wouldn't have had any idea bourgeois to do with this. nonsense <laughs> <laughs> no i wasn't a good philosopher i wasn't very good at that <laughs> um I yeah, I, it's funny. I I think you're both absolutely right. I think maybe we, one thing I also wanted to talk about was like the pertinence of this book still, because one of the things like people who talk about Codwell, insofar as there are still people that talk about him a lot, like one of the things they bring up about this book is how insane it is that somebody talking about physics, like supposedly like a lay person talking about physics almost a hundred years ago, it's still able to be pertinent to this day. And on one hand, I think that that's definitely true. But I mean, he he is talking about like that there is this 
this incoming revolutionary change. And it definitely talks about what you're saying, Dan, about this optimism of the time, right? Where it's like, hey, we got the Soviet Union, you know, how much longer can it actually take until the whole world like goes communist? You know what I'm saying? But um, I think that this kind of mirrors what's happened in the economic base to be like a little bit vulgar, like really, really well, because these ideas have just totally stagnated, right? Like it, I'm not saying that there haven't been um, leaps forward in our understandings of quantum mechanics, but this main question that he's posing is still a real one that nobody has an answer to how we can kind of like um, marry these two ideas if we need to, these two ideas, quantum mechanics and general relativity. And I think that like, especially if we talk about the last 50 years, when we think about kind of the political economy and since the kind of like birth growth and then maybe like moving on of neoliberalism and this kind of just like general state that we're in of like the general like ruling class is not wanting a economic crisis to form that would be big enough to kind of reset the reset the system i've just been kind of like wondering if maybe that mirrors this kind of like general stagnation in culture and in um i suppose physics and science there's a bunch of sirens that are just about to go by. So maybe I just kind of wrap this up quickly, but like, I just think that there's something interesting here in that this book is still pertinent and that speaks to Codwell's genius, but it also speaks to like a kind of depressing kind of the failure of the workers movement and the kind of general stagnation that we're in now. I haven't, I haven't read anything from um, studies in the dying culture, but it seems like he's applying a lot of this stuff, a lot of these similar ideas on the subject and the object divide to different aspects of culture, to psychoanalysis and to love and all of these different things. And I think maybe I'm just a bit of a pessimist where I'm like, oh, cool. These things, these ideas that he's putting forward are still pertinent. And then I'm like, oh my God, they're actually still pertinent. That's incredibly depressing. Like nothing's changed in these past 90 years or whatever. I, he had a book which was never published on biology and it's a shame because I'd love to read that partly because biology obviously underwent the sequencing revolution and therefore there was like a, it, it was a huge amount of money that went into biotechnology. It became kind of the field in terms of like having research funding and uh, like new research programs stru- sprouting up all the time. So I think it would be interesting to like, see how he applied his ideas and whether they're still relevant in that in that case i mean a lot of physicists have ended up particularly theoretical physicists have um ended up transferring into biological fields because the skill set is the same um but there's just more i guess fruitful um research avenues in biology since the sequencing revolution or they just give Um, like ted talks right where they just go or (laughs) yeah (laughs) work for industry.com or whatever (laughs) Well, yeah, I mean, so I, I guess like a lot of biologists are kind of moving that way as well. So, uh, yeah, I mean, in some ways it just reminds me of, um, you know, and again, maybe applying it slightly vulgarly, but like real and formal subsumption and how they don't happen like in a linear fashion across different sectors. And so you have kind of, you've reached this point in the physics where you're like, it, 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 to some extent it feels like... Um, a degenerated research program and so you've had this shift into biology and like a lot of fields are hitting that in a sense like even in population genetics you have this idea that we have so many different processes and we cannot reconcile them in terms of actually measuring them concretely um because there's too much going on and we it's not just a question of computing power it's can you actually like study these things together um are we going to like reach a similar phase there and then what wh- where where do things go from there it would be very funny if like we get communism and then just day one, it's like, <laughs> oh, here's how gravity affects subatomic <laughs> particles, duh. <laughs> mm. Because it'd be interesting to know what, what it is. I, I don't assume any of us know. It'd be interesting to know what it is that would be necessary to overcome some of these things. I mean, it might just be we need bigger colliders or we need to be able to make better observations of, I don't know, supermassive black holes or something um well is is it seems like it it, is not what he's saying about like quantum mechanics just as simple as like yeah it's totally fine for the the for the observer to be 
affecting what they're observing. That's fine. Mm-hmm. You yeah, don't I mean, need to think about it anymore. I mean, yeah, maybe, yeah, exactly. But was something I was trying to and I think it's something I've been thinking and been difficult to work out how to articulate is like, um, maybe what he's trying to get us to the point is to where this 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 crisis just doesn't matter. You know, like at least for our like experiential understanding of human beings' relationship to the world, or um, maybe it doesn't matter anyway. So, in the, like. Um, yeah, I don't really know where to go with that, but I think you're right, Jack. That like, um, I don't know. Yeah, no, I do think I do think that's kind of to a certain extent what he's saying is he's just like it's creating a problem where there kind of isn't one. Like the reason that this is a crisis in physics is because the bourgeoisie, the bourgeois conception of science is being confronted in a very real and quote unquote unexplainable way with the falsity of their subject object divide right it's like it, this is not a one-way street the subject is not is not the only one that influences things right he's basically saying that like if that's the way that you think about these things you're never going to be able to understand quantum mechanics because you're being like slapped in the face with a particle doing something different as soon as you observe it right so maybe it is just as simple as like is this a crisis maybe not you know um I think maybe one, one like last kind of thing is to just touch on um, the influence that this seems to have had on ecological thought. Um, I know that Dan and I have talked kind of quite a bit before on the show about the difference between like environmentalism and ecology and about how environmentalism kind of broadly stated is a bit of a, not reactionary, but a bit of a bourgeois pursuit insofar as it's like this idea of, you know, how can we sustainably, um, keep plundering the environment so that we can keep cutting down all of the rainforests, like plant new rainforests so we can continue to just cut them down in, you know, however many years. Whereas ecology is a bit more nuanced in its understanding of the kind of subject object divide where it says that there kind of isn't one. Like if you really ever want to produce, you know, food ecologically, then you need to understand that, um, you know, it's this idea of the kind of like Luantin and Levin slash like Jason W. Moore, like, web of life stuff about you are influencing um, your environment and so far as you can actually use that word, but your environment is actually influencing you as well. So like if you set up a field to grow crops on, uh, you are affecting that environment that you're kind of trying to keep in this artificial homeostasis, but also the ecology around you is going to be influencing that and it's going to be influencing what you can grow and how you can produce these different things. And it's kind of a shame. I mean, maybe he did. I don't think he did. It's kind of a shame that he didn't write explicitly about this idea, Codwell, I mean, um, about ecology, because all of these ideas that he has here are, are like so eminently applicable to a really excellent understanding of ecology. And one that I think like in terms of second order cybernetics, like people like Beer is like really kind of influenced that way of thinking about things this kind of like if you're trying to study a system you need to understand the environment that it's within because it's affecting the system as well as the you know the system is influencing it um and so yeah i think that it's funny i didn't really necessarily expect kind of like a ecological bent to this text that was ostensibly just about physics from a cultural critic but um it certainly is there yeah i don't know what is um I spent quite a long time trying to work out what he meant by when he was talking about nature in this, like to what degree to read that as like a, um, in our sort of 21st century context of being, of living in a world where we have a changing ecology and a changing climate. Um, I think in this, mostly what he's talking about is just like recognizing a world that you sort of like are actively participating in, I guess. Yeah. I think generally just like wealth and kind of like use values and things like that. Like he's talking about, you know, the natural world maybe mm-hmm. yeah is interesting i mean if his definition of dialectics is like you know bi-directional influence when you're trying to study two different things it's a pretty simple one i got caught up somebody asked me what is dialectics jack the other day and i was just like <laughs> ah i didn't expect to be asked that i was like completely thrown off course i might just be like <laughs> yeah subject object divide bi-directional influence omnidirectional influence yeah you can probably go worse. Um, 
Do we have any any kind of like last things we want to say that we haven't gotten to from either either you two or just kind of general ideas and takeaways from the text, like how useful it really is? Well, there's a moment toward the end of this, and it sort of speaks to what you were just saying about dialectics. It kind of like reading this has sort of like re-energized me to I mean, it hasn't 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 made me any more fluent or um given me any greater understanding of how to deploy the idea of dialectics, either in general conversation or in um, anything more academic or um, reading or research driven. Um, but I do enjoy the kind of like history that's laid out in this of the um, the relationship between the nature of the productive social relations and how that sort of influences the development of physics. And then also like later on in the text, like the general relationship between um human beings and objects in the world and how he's imagining he sort of he gives a gives some hints of what like a communist relationship subject object relationship might look like um obviously he sort of like talks about a uh, aristotelian or sort of medieval physics where sort of gods at work all the time and um like there's this sort of um because they're living in modes of production whereby it's all about people's control and ownership of the activity and the work of other people. They're living sort of like in slave or serf modes of production. Like any action in the world in a, on a sort of in the realm of physics is considered to have this um, permanent mover sort of directing it. Um, and he sort of distinguishes that from um, sort of bourgeois modes of physics where there's this sort of concept of like a, original starting point all the particles are set in motion by some god force but then it's all down to law and um various scientific laws after that which he's sort of saying is sort of like um paralleled in um bourgeois concepts of economic law and that kind of thing and then there's a bit toward the end where he um he talks about um primitive communism and the sort of like primitive relationship to objects in the world um, which he sort of describes as a form of animism, but like seeing everything in the world as something that acts under its own force in the same way that I act as a, um, as both a sort of object and a subject, you know, as something in connection with the world um, and autonomous in another way. And it was, it, it was a, it's a very brief sketch of what he gives of like, what would an advanced communist version of that primitive communist relationship to objects look like and i don't know what answer he gives but it's left me sort of like um ex trying to explore the idea and also more excited to go on and try and understand dialectics more if that is what he it is that he's trying to describe it's like this a dialectical relationship to objects in the world that could be a new subject object to relationship of communism i guess but um there's a theme in this book that we haven't touched on, but I enjoyed the course that he takes. We'll just read a bunch of Mao, Dan. And mm -hmm. That's how we'll understand dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> I've got my little Mao book behind me. I think. Yeah, yeah me too. Very, very treasured. <laughs> I, think, I think the only the, the primary gift that Jack and I give each other is sort of like Maoist texts that we find. <laughs> in. <laughs> Dan, give me like a very couture, very like old little red book. That's one of my most prized possessions. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can't believe we haven't mentioned uh, Laplace's Demon. I was utterly mm. obsessed with Laplace's Demon when I was younger. <laughs> um, I don't really know why, um, but it's the idea that if um, under like this, like Newtonian universe, if you know the position and velocity of every particle at any given moment, you can predict like the entire future of the universe. <laughs> And I loved this idea. Like I was, yeah. Um, like I, I, so I think when I first started getting into science, the idea that like science could know everything um, just seemed very appealing. And now I'm like, that's 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 insane. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know what I just wanted to bring it up because I, I um, think I think I always like <clears throat> I was always under this impression too. And I was always like when I was in like high school and stuff, I'd be like, wait, so if that's true. Then it, when, you know, the universe stops expanding and it contracts again, then everything's just going to keep happening in the same exact way, man. Time's a flat circle. It's all just the same <laughs> thing. But yeah, it's interesting. The big calculator. I, I like it. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah. <sighs> All right. Well, I think that's pretty much it. I mean, there's so much, there's quite a bit in this book and it's written. Um, it's relatively accessible. I'd say, I mean, it's the first bit, the first chapter is like a really good rundown of, well, I want to say it's a good rundown of like Newtonian to Einstein's um, physics, like history of physics between those two it was written almost a hundred years ago though. So maybe it's not, or you can probably get something better, probably Stephen Hawking's book or something like that. Um, but I, I did find this really, really, really excellent. I mean, it's just a, to a certain extent, right. It's just like a really well thought out, expansion on Marx's dictum of like the ideas of any given age or the ideas of the ruling class and like applying those to certain things. And I actually think f- using the crisis of, of physics as a framing mechanism for that is like really genius and really, really smart and insane that just like some guy was able to do that. I think that to a certain extent that kind of prefigures what communism is going to look like again. You know, the guy working at Tesco is being like, you're using the wrong neutrons or whatever, but yeah, <laughs> it's really excellent. <laughs> All right. Mm-hmm. Well, if we don't have anything else, um, Viv, thank you very much for coming on and gracing us with your um, physics knowledge and your um, science knowledge. Uh, it was a blast. We'll definitely do it again. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Hey everybody, Jack here. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. The song that you heard on this episode is Music to Kill Bad People To by King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard. You can go ahead and check this song out much, 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 much more on their Bandcamp at kinggizzard.bandcamp.com. If you want to go ahead and get in touch with us, chat shit, tell us that we're wrong, whatever you want to do, you can go ahead and do that at auxiliary statements at gmail.com you can just send us a message there or you can get in touch with us on twitter on discord on instagram you're a smart person you can find these places we got a youtube we post stuff there as well sometimes we stream thank you so much for listening till next time